We can be as separate as the fingers, and all things essential and mutual progress, we can be as one as the hand. Accusing a man who is being lynched, who is being hung on a tree, uh, simply because he struggles vigorously against his lyncher. The victim is accused of violence, but the lyncher is never accused of violence. And I only point this out because... I must be telling the truth when I, when I speak. That whenever a man goes through the courts, that he is abiding by the laws of the land, and that man who is willing to stand up with that decision is a brave man, regardless of what his beliefs might be. And it is because of our effort toward getting straight to the root that people oftentimes think we are dealing in hate. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. You can live almost anywhere if you fight to get in. You can enter almost any nightclub, you can enter almost any bar, and nothing will happen. But it almost means that there is a bar, there is a hotel, there is a doorman, there is an elevator boy, there is somebody every day. There is that one place you cannot go, which means you enter every door on edge. Hello, friends, and welcome to Freedom Speaks Podcast. I am your host, Craig Woodall. We explore many subjects and many issues so that freedom has a voice through you, our listeners. And now, here's our episode. The following program contains distressing content covering graphic details of lynchings in America. Please proceed with caution. Episode 001 of Black Tide Affair When I received orders to... Hill Air Force Base, Utah, I remember thinking, where the hell is this place? Geographically, I knew that Utah existed, kind of knew where it was, but I really didn't have any notion of what type of area I was going to be in. You know, suffice it to say that I did some kind of research and I basically knew it wasn't around water, the type of water that I had grown accustomed to. Being around, my mother was in the Navy and there was no ocean, it was landlocked. I pretty much thought it was going to be a terrible scenario. Uh, I actually I actually remember the first night, if you will, that I came to Utah. I went I was traveling from Andrews Air Force Base, which is somewhere in the DC area. And uh, my arrangements were made, and I came to, I flew into Salt Lake. At that time, it wasn't International Airport, but it was Salt Lake, you know, airport. And uh, I remember making the arrangements, getting in. I had my my duffel bag with me and all the things that I had, which wasn't a lot. It's just a bag that contained my uniforms and, you know, some of the belongings that I had. But um, I was traveling from that area to here and some bus picked me up and I remember traveling so from Salt Lake City you would have to go north towards Ogden where Hill Air Force Base was and in the darkness of the night to the east at that time I didn't know it was east but it, it was to the right of the vehicle I was in it was a van if I remember and maybe there was like three or four people but I remember seeing this mass of darkness in the sky. I honestly thought it was clouds. I thought that there was to the right of me these, this mass of clouds. It looked strange to me on some level, but they were continuous through the whole trip. It probably was like a you know, 30 or 40 minute uh, drive, but it was a mass that I, I completely remember there. So I get on on the base, uh, get situated in where I was going to be living. I can't remember if if there was like an interim place that I had to be at. uh, But what I do remember is the next morning, waking up, getting dressed, taking a shower, I'm sure. and, And I stepped outside and looking off to the distance, 
it was to my left at the time so again to the east I see these beautiful mountains and they were snow covered it was beautiful I mean I remember thinking in my mind that these mountains were so big and that's when I realized that what I had been seeing were not clouds <laughs> and uh, that that was like the beginning of my first impressions of Utah maybe throughout the day did I also kind of notice that I hadn't seen any black people yet um, it might have been kind of early but not too early but literally the first black person I saw I mean that might be an exaggeration but the first black person that I saw was on a billboard and <laughs> I wish I could I, maybe I will I'll go back and and see what the actual billboard that I saw but it was a billboard of the Utah Jazz that was kind of uh, <laughs> the foundation for what I was thinking about wow this is just a a state or an area of just white people uh, sometime after I arrived in Utah in 1991 I met uh, my wife who later on became my my ex-wife but uh, remains to be my friend to this day she is from she's from around Castledale Utah or Orangevale Utah or um, somewhere near Price I remember having a conversation with her because as you go into the town that she's from uh, you travel from Salt Lake City past Provo, Orem, you know, all those places, and uh, we take the Spanish Fork exit, go through this pass, uh, it's a very mountainous pass, and I remember a number of times her telling me that, uh, you know, you have to drive this way and move over to the side. It was always like a perilous type scenario <laughs> driving to her hometown. But once you get there, it's like a Really, not a desolate area, but uh, really like you'd imagine the wild, wild west to be. It just looks like uh, it's away from technology and it's away from, from where everything is. In fact, going there a couple of times, uh, when they need to go Christmas shopping or they need to get something different, if you will, they would travel to Salt Lake City to go to the malls and those kind of things. But I remember having the conversation with her asking her what you do when you you know you have something going on or you know some crime or something big happens and and jokingly this was again in 1991 jokingly she said we round up the posse so it's not that i have a problem with being around all white people at least not in this day and time that i sit and speak and record this this episode but it, it is something that you recognize. You always recognize when you are in an environment that is different from you, from what you're used to or different from what maybe you even want. I mean, we, we seek to surround ourselves with um, people and things that, are, that fit into a certain category. It's just, I think that's just, this is natural. So Utah represented on some level something different from me. I was watching a show called Watchmen. This particular show presented to me a scene where there was a white man, by the way, lynched. Uh, he was being lynched. The lynching in and of itself put before me in my mind a question. And the question was simply, I wonder what the last lynching was in each state. So what was the last lynching that occurred in each, in each state? Ultimately, that's how this podcast came about. That question. Where would I start? You know, which state would I look at? What resource would I start looking into to, to find out the answer to that question? So naturally, I started with Utah. And my choice with regards to this podcast and 
how I present it to you, the audience, um, is to find a way to take this practice of lynching and what it represents and, and how it comes about, how it became effective, because it was an effective way to to keep a certain portion of our nation down, that being specifically black people. But it's not just black people. <laughs> I, I kind of think of it as that lynching is not a respecter of persons. Respecter of persons, that, that phrase comes from a biblical term, God is not a respecter of persons. And by the way, lynchings is not a respecter of persons. If you lynch someone or if someone is lynched, the, the message of that lynching is very clear. It involves fear and, and, uh, and hate. Um, but it also, again, leaves a message that says, if you do this or if you don't do this, then this is what will happen to you. But it's part of our history. It's part of how we, how we understand that this mentality, if you will, is propagated through silence or by remaining silent and not giving freedom its voice. Utah's last lynching was of a black man not originally from Utah. On many levels, I feel he represents me and my life in Utah but in 1925. And his previously unmarked tomb now reads, Robert Marshall, lynched June 18, 1925, a victim of intolerance. May God forgive. June 18, 1925, there were many postcards that were sent out about this day and the incident. A few days before he was lynched, Robert Marshall shot James Milton Burns. Uh, James Milton Burns didn't die immediately. In fact, uh, it seems as though there were extreme measures to save his life. And uh, people called about uh, whether or not he was going to live or not. But it, it turned out that he did die. It became known on some level I mean, it's not, it's not uh, Google, it's not Twitter, it's not Instagram, you know, where everybody had knowledge of the fact that this man was dead, but uh, word of mouth made it so that, one, it was known that what happened, whether or not he lived, he didn't live, and that who allegedly was the person who did it. And I say allegedly, but I, I'm going to almost concede that it's known that Robert Marshall killed James Milton Burns. What really is the question is, what happened afterwards? What are the events that led up to uh, him being caught the evidence being found, and then what happened thereafter. There were witnesses to the event. They were two little kids. So it, it really is not a question as to whether or not Robert Marshall killed James Byrne. In fact, when he was caught, the gun, James Milton's gun, was found. Robert Marshall, you know, he, he confessed, if you will, to the murder. Robert Marshall was on the run. The sheriffs of the day basically set up a, a net to catch him. And where Robert Marshall went was George Gray's place. I mean, we can only imagine like what was going on when these two had the encounter. But ultimately, this man took him in. He said, I'll feed you. You can sleep. You'll be fine. So fast forward to the next day. George Gray decides that he's going to, I guess, go into town. And what I think is kind of interesting is, is that, you know, we've heard the term snitches get stitches, those kind of things. And George Gray is in town at a store, apparently getting food so that he can continue to feed Robert Marshall, he hears people talking about 
this incident that occurred. Someone was killed and it was Robert Marshall that did this. And by the way, we should just kill all the niggers and just get rid of this problem. I don't think anybody can fault George Gray for feeling that if he could even be remotely considered part of this problem of something that he didn't even do, what would you do? You know, you value life and you say, well, I'm not going to be the one that's going to die for this, this person. So he decides to go around the corner uh, to the Utah Fuel Company office. And he talked to Joseph Parmley. And uh, he goes ahead and calls and rounds up a number of people. John Daskalakis, the night watchman. E.E. E. Jones, the superintendent of Castlegate Mine. E.P. Beach. J.O.S. Caldwell. Henry East and W.H. Broyles. Whether or not they had uh, the ability to do so, jurisdiction, if you will, uh, this group of people came to Gray's house and with a signal from him, did they round up Robert Marshall. And this is where the intolerance begins. When do you actually decide in your mind that the person in front of you has the ability to take you in, right? Whether or not you think that you've done something wrong or you acknowledge it or whatever, if you're on the run, when do you decide that this is the cat that's going to take me in? Robert Marshall succumbed knowing that he had actually committed the crime. And all of these people... God knows why they decided that they were even the people that could do this. But if it would have been some blue men that came to his door and said, hey, you you did this thing, so come with us. And by the way, at the end of the night, you're going to be hanged. Yeah, well, that didn't happen. It wasn't blue people. It happened to be a bunch of white guys that rounded him up. And if you knew that they were going to hang you, And I say hanging as if that's a good thing, but a hanging might have been just, right? A lynching, on the other hand, to me, on any circumstance, is never just. And this is what eventually happened to Robert Marshall. He was lynched. He wasn't just hung. Well, the the question is, do we know what lynching is? Webster defines lynching as to put to death as by hanging, by mob action, without approval or permission. Despite the fact that we can't be perfect in anything that we do, subjectively, or even objectively, and I say those two things, and it's almost a blurry line with regards to what is subjective and what is objective, but We all have a choice. I mean, to me, choice is one of the biggest things that causes us to make better decisions in the future. You have the choice to look at me as an individual speaking to you and not even seeing you and saying something that you can or cannot relate to and vice versa. I can look at you and say, I have, no, I have no knowledge of what you think or what you do or what you have done in the past. But if in the moment you say X and I agree, then we can be on one accord. But when it comes down to you and I, you and me, a person looking at each other and saying X, then what is it that we want to accomplish in that moment? Well, first of all, I want to walk away with my life, with my dignity, uh, with my health. So if you do anything other than that, then I don't like you. And really, when it comes down to it, that's it. Don't take those things away from me. 
does America do people do we need to be blindfolded and and address each other sure that's a possibility but that's not happening we have to walk to our jobs we have to walk to school we have to do those things so walking with our eyes closed is not a possibility but mentally um, I can approach you with my mental mind closed to all of the negative things that I've experienced before I met you and accomplish something. So that's what I'm talking about. Almost certainly did George Gray not anticipate what was going to happen to Robert Marshall hours later, right? Because if he if he did know that that was going to happen, would he have said anything to anybody? Yeah, you know, I'm going to tell you as a black person myself, I would have never, ever told on somebody, even if I thought it was the absolute right thing to do, if I thought that the thing that happened to Robert Marshall was going to happen, no. You would never get it out of me, ever. I, I feel like I understand that that George Gray didn't have in his mind to to hurt Robert Marshall. Really, what he decided to do, or what he desired to do, was to just see the next day. It was estimated that 800 to 1,000 men, women, and children witnessed the lynching of Robert Marshall. They described it as a necktie party, hence the name of this episode, A Black Tied Affair. District Attorney Fred W. Keller filed arrest warrants for 11 men considered to be the ringleaders for the lynching of Robert Marshall. They were all released on bail for $7,500. There were 125 witnesses that were set to testify at the grand jury, but none of them were willing or able to do so out of fear. So none of the 11 men, consequently no one, was convicted for the murder of Robert Marshall. About uh, three or four weeks ago, I traveled to Price, Utah, to see if I could find Robert Marshall's grave. I became aware that uh, his previously unmarked grave uh, had been replaced with uh, a memorial of sorts. I actually found it and, and uh, spent a moment at the gravesite. The audio is not wonderful, but I believe it's something that you all might enjoy. So, so here it is. So eight should be in this corner over here oh, somewhere. There it is. Where? With the uh, reef on it. So we, oh. looked, we looked at the thing right there. So we saw the back of it. Yeah. Try not to step on people's headstones. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's a headstone right in front of you. Oh yeah. So Robert Marshall lived June 1825. Victim of intolerance, God forgive. Oh, I love that someone put a wreath on it. I know, right? That's awesome. Do you want to go over by it and kind of? Yeah. So I'll just I'll just say have a moment of time. Lord, thank you for getting us here safely, and thank you for the experience of being able to see something in history that's happened in Price, Utah, and for us to be able to witness it on some level. I pray that you have us be able to take this experience and utilize it for something greater and bigger to honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well.
Nearly immediately after visiting Robert Marshall's gravesite, uh, my fiance and I decided that we were going to try to find what was known now as the hanging tree. We googled a number of places and found, you know, some kind of idea of where it might be, but we weren't sure, so we headed towards uh, maybe a gas station or a little mart or something like that. Maybe we'd run into somebody and see if we could find it. Turns out that we began going about three miles south of where the courthouse was, or at least where the cemetery was, which is kind of where we discovered it might be. And so we we headed off that way. It seemed as though we were going away from where it probably was. So we turned around after traveling maybe five or ten minutes, and uh, we headed back. And as we were going back, a police officer, a police car, was behind us. And, And I'll be honest with you, in this small town, clearly not knowing where I was, I kind of thought that uh, to check my speedometer, make sure I was going the correct speed, and uh, we ended up turning around and and uh, pulling off to the side of the road. I approached the police officer, and again, uh, I made sure the officer could see my hands, and uh, you know, I motioned for him to roll down the window. And I began talking to him about um, this place that I was looking for. This officer was probably about, you know, mid-30s or so, and he seemed to kind of be familiar with what I was talking about. I think he even referred to it as the hanging tree. But he wasn't quite sure uh, where it was, but he, he kind of hinted that there might be somebody in that area back in the direction that we had come from that would know. But he was interested in in our visit to Robert Marshall's grave, almost as if he would, yeah, he planned to to go back and, and, and take a look. It turns out that when we had pulled off on the side of the road, that uh, we got stuck in the snow. My fiance's vehicle is a, is this, I forget what, what the hell the name of it is, but anyway, her sports vehicle wasn't fit for that little patch of snow. In fact, where the police officer indicated that the hanging tree might be, he definitely said it was a little off road and that car wasn't going to make it. Anyway, so trying to get out of the area which you were, get unstuck from the snow, we were right in front of uh, someone's house. Turns out that this older man probably in his in his mid to late seventies came out and you know, he could see that we were in in a bad way. He basically said that he would get in the vehicle and we would push. And so we pushed and, and maneuvered and tried to get the vehicle unstuck, which we actually ended up doing. I took the opportunity to inquire about the hanging tree. Nearly immediately, this gentleman, whose name I did not get, looked at me and said, "Uh, you're talking about the tree where they used to hang black people? And we're like, yes. And without going over the rest of the story or the trip that we had had, he told us that we were really close to it, in fact, and it was just down the road as if he was just pointing a stone's throw away. But he he also agreed that, that our vehicle was not going to make it. Ultimately, my point is, is that today in the little town that has the history that it has, people are people. The interaction that I had with the police officer, the past experience that I had bringing to the table when I approached him and inquired and got the the information that I got, and the final interaction that I had with the gentleman who helped us get our our car unstuck it was a simple honest interaction and in my mind I think that all of us are better for it I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of you for listening please 
uh, help us out by giving us a like and a share. I have some information, some pictures and some documents and those kind of things about the case of Robert Marshall that I will be posting on the website. So feel free to check out our gallery. And again, please like and share and subscribe. I am your host, Craig Woodall. This is Freedom Speaks Podcast.